Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Um, I'm Stan. I'm talking to you from Seattle, Washington right now, so good morning for me. And welcome to Stage and Theater Lighting for Schools. This is an AIA accredited webinar, 1LU. If you have not already, please provide your AIA number to receive credits. We'll follow up uh, with your uh, with reporting your credits uh, after the webinar today. So, so my name is Stan Lippin. I am president and co-founder at Pure Lighting Company. And in terms of my responsibilities, especially on the stage side, I am a STEAM education ambassador, uh, very much a believer in the importance of STEAM education in the public school and private school network. Um, and doing my best to promote that uh, via technology opportunities um, and student integration and training with those opportunities. My background is in electrical and computer engineering. I'm a graduate of Rutgers University in the great state of New Jersey, which is a hop, skip, and many jumps from my current residence in Seattle. And I'm a professional member of the IS and US ITT and a uh, contributing author to magazines and publications, including LD and A, that is the IAS's uh, publication. So before we get started, I just want to say a few words about our company, Pure Lighting Company, um, and a little bit as to why you may be on this webinar, and a little bit of, I suppose, credentialing about ourselves. So we are, uh, though we're Pure Lighting, we are uh, wider than that. Uh, we have specialities in all sorts of technology systems. So that's going to include stage, theater, and auditorium lighting and AV systems, TV and broadcasting studio technology systems, as well as some specialty uh, lighting systems, including germicidal lighting uh, and IAQ improvement, architectural lighting, specification, design, uh, control design, commissioning, and integrations, uh, custom lighting fixture design and development, as well as staying abreast and on top of all new developments in the industry that's so going to include code compliance, new trends, and green practices. And then, very important, we'll talk about this uh, towards the end of today's webinar, uh, professional system training for staff and operators. So very important that the technology systems are going into facilities, and in this case, schools are able to be used by staff um, and in the case of schools, students as well. And uh, in terms of working with us, we do have a full bevy of services for you, for architects and engineers. That includes these AI accredited webinars and the Lunch and Learns. If you're interested in scheduling something more particular for your firm, uh, reach out to us. I'll be happy to set something up. Uh, in terms of webinars, we do a monthly series. Uh, I'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, we do system design and specification, uh, technology consultation and recommendations, photometric and product demonstrations, value engineering and project quotations, on-site and remote sales, customer and technical support, comprehensive project management, and system commissioning integrations and training. In short, we are there to support your projects, whether it is working directly with you as lighting designers and specifiers, or as partners with you acting as project managers and us taking over some of these systems. But hopefully today, by the end of this webinar, you'll feel a bit more empowered to take on stages and theaters, especially for schools, or at least if you don't normally uh, dive into that space, you might be encouraged to. It is a beautiful space to be in. And it's uh, something that we'll start this webinar in just a few moments of why we should be looking at stages and theaters, um, diving in and making sure that we're providing public and private schools performance, art, center level uh, quality. And I mentioned some of those uh, webinars. So we have a free series every month. We do a different webinar on a different topic. This is the next three months. So we have Indoor air quality, IAQ, IQ, happening next month, where we'll be diving into uh, the White House's Clean Air and Buildings Challenge and why it's so important. We have Lighting Controls 101 in January, where we'll talk about wired, wireless, uh, different protocols, different types of controls, 
some common problems that we might incur and ways that we can get around them. And in February, during the cold, long winter, we'll talk about bar UVC, which is the future of IAQ technology. Uh, that's something that'll be a, a we're interested and uh, looking forward to that webinar because there's a lot of really cutting edge development in that space. But you're here for stages and theaters, so let's dive in. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of a video and sorry, full discretion, this is a promotional video we use when we are talking to clients. I'm not here trying to sell this. I actually want to go and use this as an opportunity to show what a holistic and comprehensive theater technology upgrade might look like. And so we'll start right here. <laughs> and on this side, please excuse the yellow highlighting right there. Um, looks like a, a child got to it, but that was me with a PowerPoint. And so when we talk about systems, we have house lighting. So it's going to, we're going to have to make sure that we're able to integrate the house. Options include RGBW house lighting for more effect. Aya lighting, which is required to make sure we have means of egress and ingress, but we can also use it for effects. We need rigging. That is what is going to hold all of our equipment. Uh, and that needs to be properly calibrated, properly done. AV integrations. If we have PACs, we have multi-purpose spaces there. We need to make sure we can integrate with sound and video components. That's going to include simple controls for all types of users, whether it's going to be trained staff or guests that are coming in to the facility. And on this side, we need to go and walk through uh, very comprehensively with a facility. So it's gonna make sure that we're able to support from the beginning. That's going to be site audits, photometric reporting, lighting plots, some middles as built. It's going to be going through, uh, making sure that the contractors are able to put this in, that everything's integrated properly, all the way through staff training and continuing education. So this is a whole process that we do need to look at. Um, there are many parties involved with a stage system. Uh, hopefully you will be taking the lead on making sure that the school system is able to utilize and adapt and incorporate their stages. And we'll talk a little bit about theater rental assistance in a moment. Uh, that is going to be something that will allow schools to actually profit off of their implementations uh, and may allow you to go and uh, do something a little bit more uh, fun and interesting, let's say that, in a school and be able to uh, provide reasons why. So why should a school look at this in the first place? So this webinar, I wanna go and keep a pretty high level, um, but we need to talk about why before we look at the technology that we wanna implement. So many reasons why a uh, high school, especially, but we can talk about middle school as well, stage theater auditorium should be at a PAC, Performing Arts Center level. It's not as expensive as it was as it once was, especially with LED technology, and the benefits are vast. So that includes hands-on team learning opportunities, professional training, uh, college and professional level for students, developmental benefits from theater programs. There's a lot of peer-reviewed research showing that additional source of income from rentals. We'll dive into that. Utilization for community events. We have work on many theaters across the nation where the high school theater is the main gathering space for the entire community, including board meetings, uh, local performances, guest speakers, um, oh, uh, uh, town halls, etc. And then, of course, a, uh, you know, capital improvements for school districts and townships and everything that that entails. STEAM learning, I mentioned uh, I am a STEAM ambassador. So STEAM is science, technology, engineering, art, and math. I am a engineer by training. That was my major. I was always a math and science kid growing up. And the integration of the A, the arts component is so important. And I'm right now speaking to a group of architects and you know, I think that you are probably the shining example of that, of having the hard science, of having the hard understanding of how to make something happen, but it's the A, the art which breathes life into it. And we can talk about that developmentally, we can talk about that in terms of 
ability to process problems, problem solve. And we can talk about that on the uh, job field and in the professional world of the need to be able to think creatively and to assess information and put it together in a cohesive way. STEAM education provides that. And the reason I'm talking about STEAM education is that the theater is a cooked in, a baked in STEAM learning center in a school. Inside of a theater, we have high-end technology and we have all different ways of understanding how that technology and the phenomena behind that technology is operating. So we get to look at things from the lens of physics. What are the interactions and forces of the rigging system? Energy and work, right? The, we're talking about things like the electrical forces, the load, uh, the electrical load, right? The way that we're able to uh, send data across electrical signals. We have optics. The lighting is fully on the optical side. And we have also the way that sound interacts. Programming and coding, very large push in the nation for that. All of the lighting and audio controls are programming and coding. And more and more, we're seeing a move away from the uh, large lighting and audio consoles and more into software. Electrical circuits, we have, of course, fine uh, and digital art in terms of the audiovisual component, in terms of the set and settings of media production, public speaking, intro to business and marketing. Uh, talk about a school that doesn't have a lot of funding but wants to put on a great performance. They're gonna have to figure out a way to do that. They're gonna have to figure out a way to get uh, you know, butts and seats. And that is something that the students could run. There was in New Jersey, I believe it was right before the pandemic, uh, there was in, Bergen County, I don't remember the school district itself, was this uh, performance of Alien. Yeah, Sigourney Weaver, Alien, a uh, full on out. And they did it on a budget. They did this amazing production. It got picked up um, by news outlets. I think um, Steven Spielberg uh, came to see it in person. So these are all things that students have the opportunity to do uh, inside of their stage system. And if we provide them with a performing arts center level quality system, then they're able to really do magnificent things. And then when we look at educational outcomes, so even beyond STEAM, just looking at a theater drama program, these are among a bevy of benefits and these are all peer reviewed uh, benefits here. So we have, we've seen higher scores on standardized tests across STEAM subjects. We've seen better attendance and lower dropout rates. So this is going to be especially important in some of our uh, more challenged uh, towns and districts. Improve self-confidence, self-esteem, communication skills, teamwork, interpersonal skills, and creativity, and improve performance and ability from students with learning disabilities. So really vast importance for schools to have this type of education. I know there was uh, about 10, 10 years ago or so, 10, 15 years ago, a little bit of a drop on the A aspect of the arts funding. And there was uh, some significant drops in performance I was seeing from that. So it is about the balancing of the two. And we want to make sure that our schools are able to uh, really utilize their systems for it. And right now is a good time to look at it. So ESSER funding can actually be applied for these upgrades. There's a few uh, criteria. So implementing strategies to accelerate learning, uh, providing principals and other school leaders with the resources necessary to address the needs of their individual schools. So that's a large blanket statement right there. Uh, also some things on sanitation and disinfection. We dive into that really quickly. Um, and ensuring that there's virtual learning capacities. All three of these are ways that a theater can be used. Now, before I dive into that, just to make sure that it's clear here is, uh, systems need to be purchased and installed by the September 23 for ESSER 2 and 24 deadline for the ESSER 3. I know that the process of uh, designing, implementing, uh, you know, specifying, all that is a very long process. So this is something that if a school wants to take advantage of the ESSER 3 funding, uh, does need to be jumped on uh, sooner rather than later. And if a school is saying something along the lines that they've already submitted their plans, 
they can reach back out to their uh, state school uh, board and adjust their plans. That is something totally allowed. And we've worked with schools in the past to do that. And in terms, I mentioned to some of the ways that this ESSER funding can be applied. Uh, when we look at a auditorium and school system, uh, theater, especially, you know, six, seven, eight hundred uh, seater theater is one of the best places for social distancing. You can use a theater as a multi-purpose space for learning or uh, classroom activities and still keep kids, uh, you know, six feet apart or greater. You have the ability to use the theater for virtual learning and recording. Uh, you'll see there in the back of a piece of technology called a PTZ, a pan tilt zoom camera, which can be integrated uh, into the general controls of the system and can be used for recording and broadcasting. And then there's also ways to incorporate disinfection lighting, uh, germicidal lighting safely inside of a theater system and in a way that won't put, uh, obstruct performances in order to go and increase the ability to sanitize, disinfect, and keep the space safe. So again, uh, I know when you're working with schools, if they're not doing a large capital improvement project, uh, funds are usually strapped and tight. And so this is a way to uh, bring this technology, bring these implementations, bring the redesign into schools and allow the schools to leverage federal funding uh, to do that for their districts and for their students. And then last here, on the side of the why is rental opportunities. So there is an ROI associated with upgrading a school stage system if they are renting it out. And there's a lot of opportunities to rent uh, regardless of where a school is in the country, from local theater groups, dance music, and other recitals, local organizations such as the Toastmasters, TED Talks, uh, traveling performers, uh, school and municipal board meetings, professional development, corporate events, the list can go on. A uh, large list, we've seen uh, some districts that we've worked with in the past that have uh, and do actively rent out their stage, making about 350000 in additional revenue uh, from rentals. And so with this, there is incentive in terms of the upgrade, uh, saving on the annual rental equipment. So this is the price paid to bring in equipment. On average, we see around 20K um, or greater spent per year. Uh, while we see, again, uh, opportunities to make two, three, even $400,000 in revenue. Uh, so an ROI can be achieved on the uh, cost of the design, in purchasing of the materials and labor uh, within three to five years. And especially in the public sector, contract leasing rates are low. And so they can go and implement that in order to go and get the whole system um, upped and redesigned. And won't go too much into this, but just for your interest here, this is this was provided to us from a uh, theater director at a New Jersey school who actively rents out his theater. This is one performance, one day, uh, three performances, I should say, at a New Jersey school, high school theater. And so with this, they were uh, able to make about $4,500 uh, from the performance in revenue. Uh, they're able to go and use the performance revenue to pay off the normal uh, payment that they would offer to custodians and uh, buildings and ground staff. Uh, and they were able to turn a profit. This also allowed some of the high school students to act as uh, some of the technicians. So they were able to make a little bit of money for themselves. So it's a great opportunity uh, for students uh, of legal working age, I should say, uh, to go and have a little part-time job, professional experience, and some responsibility, um, again, while making some money, generating some profit, um, and taking off a little bit of the uh, burden of the taxpayers, or at least the school itself, uh, in terms of future development. All right, so I showed the video before, so I'm not gonna show uh, this one right here. Let's uh, start to dive in a little bit into the technology. And from there, we'll, uh, we'll see what it looks like when we do implement a modern school system.
So when we look at a system, it's going to be backed uh, by four major components. The controls are going to be the, the brains of the operation here. Without proper controls, no matter what we put in, uh, we're not going to have the ability to maximize it or in some cases even use it um, at all. So we'll have four aspects here. So we have the lighting console. This is something that we've seen for a long time. Uh, we are starting to see a slow movement towards more software-based, uh, laptop-based systems, but for the, uh, the foreseeable future, our consoles will still be utilized. We have wall-mounted touchscreens, which provide simplified control. We have one-touch controls. These are going to be entry stations um, that allow for um, presets to be activated by, again, one-touch controls. And we have our relay panels, which allow distribution of all the controls throughout a theater. What we see here is a typical one-line diagram for a stage system. So in the very middle, what you see is the processor. The processor is what we can call the, the brainstem or the nervous system of a theater system. When we look to the bottom left, we see the control console. This is going to be the brains of the operation. This is the way that we go and send in information to each of our devices. And the devices, while typically they're going to be lighting fixtures, uh, they can also include different things such as uh, automated motorized rigging. In some of our high-end performances and uh, performance houses, this is maybe beyond the scope of a typical school. You'll see uh, dynamic rigging elements uh, that are integrated into the performance uh, a, you know, such as moving uh, lights are able to move up and down or objects are moving up and down, or you'll see sometimes even um, motorized like um, light fixtures that can uh, play around in real time. And so different ways that the lighting console can be used to control different elements of the system. Inside of a lighting console, oftentimes you're gonna have touch screens. Uh, oftentimes it's two different monitors, which will allow uh, one to look at a lighting plot while being able to adjust the settings or activate different presets uh, with the other monitor. Going back in, we have, again, the processor. The processor is going to be what interfaces between the controls and the actual devices. So before we go to the right side here of the screen, on the left side, you see a bunch of preset stations. You saw them right here in the one-touch controls. And in this case, you have six different preset stations. These will be strewn throughout the auditorium. You'll have some by the main entrances. You'll have some backstage. And these will allow, again, for simple control. So it might be as simple as controlling the house lighting, turning you know all on, 50% uh, dim, to having different presets for a different play or performance that's going to be used. These are these can be uh, recommissioned and changed at any time. And there is the option to change what the control system takes priority over the other one, depending on the specific needs of the school. Now, when we look at the right side of this diagram here, this is where we're going to start to dive into the actual devices. And I mentioned uh, rigging as a potential device, but for the sake of simplicity, let's go and talk about lighting fixtures. So for the most part, this will be lighting fixtures. It'll go and pass in first into a relay panel, which is going to provide the electrical uh, distribution to the different devices and will allow um, on-off signaling to occur so that the LED components and the drivers inside of the fixtures don't burn out prematurely. Now, if you notice this band of wire scrolling down, these are moving into what are called gateway devices. And typically these wires, as we'll see in the next slide, are going to be CAT5E or CAT6 wires. Uh, we'll talk about that again in just a moment. These are going to be control wires being passed into different gateway devices. Now, the controls are going to be passing through via a protocol called DMX. Uh, this is something that we will dive into a little bit uh, as we go through this uh, presentation. 
DMX allows for a wide bevy of specific control and application. Um, DMX typically is going to be consisting of or one gateway of DMX will have what's called 512 channels. And each channel allows for a signal from 0 to 255, so an 8-bit um, signal that allows for very fine-tuned uh, dimming, control of colors, fan speed, and a whole lot of information. Each of these gateways with about 512 channels, assuming anywhere between 16 to 32 channels per device, which is a typical um, the type of lighting fixture we'll see, will allow for about 16 to 32 devices per gateway. This is going to allow for a wide amount of control and flexibility and variety of fixtures inside of our school settings. Now, in this one line diagram, you see multiple different gateways. These are going to be to different areas of the auditorium, to different pipes, uh, to different areas, including over stage, front of house, uh, maybe a secondary uh, row of spotlighting or ellipsoidals, whatever it may be. All right. And so, again, from here, these gateways are going to provide the control to the different devices. The electrics themselves will provide the power. To the different devices and that's all going to be controlled via the processor. The processor will say what's on and what signals are being sent to the device itself. You'll see up here this is going to be an emergency uh, setting. We'll talk a bit about that later on. Uh, there is code requirements inside an auditorium uh, that maintain that lights need to be on or house lighting needs to be on in the case of fire or emergency. And in school settings, uh, there are also needs to integrate in with a general panic system uh, in the case of, uh, God forbid, something like an active shooter or an um, act of nature. So I mentioned the DMX protocol. So DMX has been around since the 80s. Uh, DMX is an acronym for digital multiplex. Um, and this is a standard used for uh, the stage and TV broadcasting industry. Before DMX was created, every different type of stage system manufacturer was using their own proprietary language. As you can imagine, that became very expensive and difficult to operate and use, and the need for standardiz standardization uh, was required, especially to allow different components from different lighting consoles, processors, and devices to interact seamlessly together in one cohesive system. One DMX universe contains 512 channels, as I said. Each channel can send a signal from 0 to 255, which again gives a lot of fine-tuned control, uh, especially when we compare against uh, re just simple relay-based systems on or off, or even 0 to 10 volt dimming, which uh, can be uh, very limited or can be incredibly detailed and accurate. We also will see um, what's called RTNet and what that is, uh, or ArtNet, is the ability to go and run DMX via Cat5e or Cat6 cable. This is a huge boon to the industry uh, because the pricing of a Cat5e or Cat6 cable is going to be a fraction, maybe a fifth, a sixth, a seventh of what DMX will be. You also can run Cat5e for a longer run than a run of DMX. Um, the weight is much uh, smaller, so it allows for a simpler uh, running throughout a facility. So this is what we'll see in most of our facilities very infrequently is DMX run uh, in long uh, distances except for touring and live production. And then you have RDM, and what RDM is, is a two-way communication protocol. So DMX typically on its own allows information to flow from the controller to the devices themselves. RDM allows for information back. So that's going to provide real-time information on the state of the device. And it's also going to be instrumental when commissioning and addressing different devices. So it's easy to know which device is which and to allow the individual DMX channels and protocols to be automatically uploaded into the lighting console and lighting controls. 
Now, what does that mean exactly? Why am I talking about addressing and the individuality of the fixtures? Well, if you look here at this information, we have an example of a 32 channel uh, device. This is gonna be a, um, it looks here like, yes, a moving fixture, which has a pan and tilt ability, which has a gobo, has all sorts of functionality. And so with all this different functionality, we want different ways to be able to address it and control it. Now, this mover from this manufacturer, I don't know uh, which manufacturer this is, the way it lays out its channels, you see, you know, channel one through 16 might be different than a competing brand, which might have gobo wheel one uh, in space number 15, color wheel in space number, um, you know, 15 instead. And this way with RDM, we're able to get the information automatically uploaded uh, into the controls, simplifies the process um, and allows for, again, the fine tuned uh, functionality and control. So talking about the DMX and the runs and all that good stuff there. So going back into this diagram. So what we're gonna look at in two seconds here is going to be these runs from the processor to our gateway stations. So what we see here is what we call home runs, long runs directly from the processor to the actual gateway, because each gateway itself will typically control one universe. Sometimes it might control two or even three universes, depending on its functionality. And so it needs to receive direct information from the processor. Now, as mentioned before, CAT 5E, CAT 6, can only run about 300 feet. There's going to be instances where the run is actually longer than that. So what we have is a technology, it's a, something that we'll call a DMX splitter, and a DMX splitter will essentially echo the signal that's sent and amplify the signal, allowing for longer runs. So that's something that needs to be looked at um, based on the positioning of the processor and the different runs inside and distances inside of a uh, auditorium. Of course, we can't always look at the hypotenuse between the processor. We need to look at the way that the distribution is actually going to happen in real time. So looking at the engineering of it and the practicalities of uh, the construction. We uh, will... Yeah, let's move on there. We have a lot to say, and I want to make sure that we end on time here. So this is what's called an entry station. So you see here that we have um, a uh, RJ45 uh, port. So it's going to be the ethernet port. It gets either clamped on, soldered in, whatever it might be. And then from this point, a DMX device can be uh, connected. So these are going to be important to have uh, throughout the stage area so that we can go and input different types of uh, equipment, whether it's going to be for the audio system or it's going to be for the lighting system. This is going to be something that we'll find uh, on all of our pipes to go and send out uh, the uh, DMX signal from the processor to uh, the devices themselves. Uh, and we'll see this throughout uh, the facility by the control system as well. Now we look at the lighting plot. So we're gonna have different types of lights for different types of purposes. The lighting plot itself is going to be required to make sure that we're able to achieve the looks that we want to achieve on stage. So if you look at this image on the right, this is called a magic plot. You see here the two different monitors that are typically used inside of a lighting or with a lighting console. So you have the magic plot itself with the actual controls that are able to adjust presets and all the settings. From here, a user can go and group different devices together, click on one, refine. And then from this information, especially now with RDM and getting the information in, we're able to go and do renderings uh, in real time to get different types of look um, or uh, you know, on stage itself using this lighting plot itself. And then what we'll see here is going to be um, the lighting plot in a more uh, non-digital form. This is going to be responsible and required for the installers or uh, after a device has been installed for the actual uh, reconfiguring, recommissioning, and recalibrating 
of different devices. And types of information that we're going to have here, what type of device are we looking at? What's the channel patch number? So where does it go in the actual uh, console and controls? What's the DMX address? Uh, what kind of, uh, where's the connection to the relay panel and the processor? What lens are we using? So some different devices, um, especially ellipsoidals, are going to have different lenses and adjust either adjustable lenses or replaceable lenses to correct the beam angle. We'll talk about that in a moment. And what's the orientation? So where is this device pointing? Different performances are going to require different types of lighting. So we want to create flexible layout. So we're going to have different positions inside of our house over stage. Typically, we would like to see uh, for a typical high school stage, about three rows that are going to provide nice filling of lighting throughout the entire stage. Maybe we have psych lighting in the back. We'll talk about that in a moment. And either one or two positions of spot lighting to go and provide that front fill. Now, based on what's happening on stage, the direction and the beam angle might change. We might want to take some of these uh, spotlights to go and light up some of the sets and setting uh, elements. We might have in one performance, uh, let's say, you know, we have a dance performance where we need a nice even wash, while we have another performance of Hamlet where um, Hamlet is giving his famous soliloquy, but he's just staying right here on stage and we want a nice spot that's going to light up that area for uh, the actor. So this is going to be important to provide and to be able to adjust uh, and to keep flexible for a school system. Now, I should have mentioned before, with our power distribution itself and the gateways, it is important to leave extra uh, electrics and extra uh, gateway compatibility inside of our different uh, pipe positions to allow for expansion, whether it's going to be uh, purchased or it's going to be rented. We never quite know exactly how the system's going to be used. So building to flexibility is going to be highly important uh, so we can future ready the system. Uh, also, we've seen many times before, especially in schools, where they might start with a very basic system, and in a few years, they have movers and all sorts of fun lights, so uh, we want to make sure that they can expand uh, as they want to. And talking about that, so we have different types of lighting. So we're going to have uh, ellipsoidals. These are going to act as uh, spotlights. They tend to have tighter beams. Uh, they can be, our, typically, they're RGBW. Uh, that's one of the benefits and blessings of uh, uh, LED technology. Follow spots are going to be exactly what they sound like. Uh, typically, they're very much um, in the back of the auditorium, and they're going to be typically manually operated, and they're going to allow um, to go and follow different talent on stage. There is technology that uh, does it fully automatically via RFID chip or um, allows for more digital via uh, mouse operation on a digital screen. Um, but oftentimes in schools, we still see manual operation. We have moving wash lights. Um, so these are movers. They allow for pan, tilt, um, and sometimes even zoom operation. Sometimes these have gobos. So a gobo is going to allow different effects. So that can be the school logo. That can be an effect that looks like waves passing, um, all sorts of fun little things that they can do. Power lights tend to be over stage. They provide a nice wider wash. So you can get a nice, even clean wash uh, across the stage. And retrofits can go and be incorporated in existing technology, uh, incorporating LED technology into a previously incandescent fixture for a more budget appropriate uh, upgrade. So we mentioned proper lighting and proper look. So a few things we want to make sure we can achieve at basic is one is a uniform uh, stage color wash. So oftentimes this is going to be accomplished with our PAR lighting. So you see here the different pipes, the different positions of those PARs are able to go give nice, even washes. So you don't notice here on the floor a little dead spots between. And then you have three-point lighting. If any of you are hobbyist photographers or videographers, you are incredibly familiar with three-point lighting. 
Three point lighting is a balancing of lighting from uh, three different angles that is used to eliminate shadowing and to provide a flattering light to uh, subjects on screen. So this is going to mean that we need to be able to provide lighting from behind, side, and uh, in front. And with this too, unfortunately, these aren't productions that we did. Because this top one is The Lion King, which um, was, was not us. Um, so these are going to be special ways that we can go and further incorporate lighting. Now, even though we didn't do The Lion King, this is an effect that we've provided in many schools um, and is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful lighting effects. So this is what's called a, a cyclorama lighting. This is going to be a wash of a clean white curtain or wall in the back of the, um, the, the back of the stage, which allows for all sorts of effects from a sunset sunrise effect using a uh, nice uh, psych lighting for that. Two things like side lighting, which provide a lot of drama with lighting and can be uh, equipped if you notice inside a Broadway house or even a, um, a concert. Typically there's vertical pipes at the side of the stage which allow that kind of lighting. Uh, mention automated and fixed moving lights, um, soft and hard spot lighting, so the way that the beam uh, and diffusers are equipped. You can have hard lighting for more drama. You can have softer lighting for more of a beautiful, um, kind of a glorious type of look. When we look at the fixture specification itself, right? So this is something that. Uh, is going to be a very integral part of the process is there's a lot that we need to look at in the technology. You know, we typically have the PARs over stage, we typically have the ellipsoidals in our front of house positions, and then we might have some sort of uh, follow spot all the way in the back of the, uh, of the auditorium area. But we need to make sure that we're uh, specifying the proper products. So one of the major things we'll be looking at is beam angle. So with beam angle, a couple things to note, uh, obviously this is going to be the spread of light. And so we want to go and when we are calculating that nice even wash, we wanna make sure that uh, we have that nice little Venn diagram effect where we have just enough coverage over one another without either it being a dead area or overly intense. So it, again, nice and even there. We also need to know that the, uh, there is going to be a direct relationship between the beam angle and the light intensity. If we concentrate the light, uh, the beam angle, the light intensity is going to go up. If we spread it out wide, it's going to go down. So based on how many devices we have, based on what we're trying to achieve, we're going to have to control the beam angle. And you do have uh, devices now with automatic zoom. So that means the automatic ability to shutter and open the beam angle. What you see down here is a fun and interesting little um, uh, note, and it's not something necessarily you need to uh, pay attention to. Most reputable manufacturers will take care of this, but this is going to be uh, when all LEDs are on the different intensity of light. Um, so typically a uh, RGBW LED board is going to be balanced with different types of chips and with different chips operating at different intensities to create the color wheel that we want. Um, but then this is something that uh, just based on the way that different colors operate, uh, you'll see different peaks and valleys. So uh, just uh, some engineering that goes behind the scenes that we should be uh, very appreciative of. And then when we look into, again, the specifications, we look at all the different controls and what these devices can do, which is vast. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm not going to go into every detail here. Um, these again, we have a, a time limit and we can go into further detail if you'd like uh, after the webinar. But some of the things we want to look at for are going to be, what is the type, outdoor, indoor? Um, so how is the product rated for what setting, outdoor stage, indoor stage, um, the IP rating, the color spectrum. So this is RGBW, but you might see things like uh, C, L or A, so C cyan, L lime, A amber, and those are going to different effects. So for example, L lime is going to give a little bit more of a greenish tinge, and that actually reflects really well on video camera. So a lot of times TV broadcasting studios will have lime chips in there. 
sometimes you'll have an amber chip and an amber chip is better able to give that classic halogen look that you know you may have seen growing up or you know that calls back to classic eras of broadway so different technology to provide different types of feels and colors and purposes you're going to see uh, the led output you're going to see the pwm frequency the pulse width modulation so this is going to be um, the way that we have the operating and flickering on and off of the device and so we've seen perhaps when we're filming something on our phone or a camera that we have a shuddering effect that's because the way that the light's turning on and the frames per second are interacting in such a way that we notice uh, sometimes we're capturing light sometimes we're not so by adjusting this, we, it allows uh, different effects and it allows us to perhaps record in a cleaner and uh, less modulated way. DMX input typically is five or three pin. Five pin is more common. Sometimes there's three pin, uh, either having cohesiveness or making it incredibly clear to make sure that the gateway devices match the uh, fixtures is a big help uh, on site during install. Uh, DMX mode, so how many channels this device has, the more channels, typically the more either control of the colors or different types of effects you can have, and DMX functions, so what are the different things that can be done. So color blending, so the ability to, again, red, green, blue, affect it differently so you get all your full spectrum of colors. You're going to have things like your zoom, so it's going to adjust, again, the beam angle, things like um you know color temperature correction so this is uh, allows for changing of the white light uh, along the kelvin um, uh, threshold so from your orangish white to your sky blue white and all different types of effects um, different types of system settings um, different ways we want to go uh, operating voltage power consumption i want to point that out here because you have power consumption here it's 220 watts while if you look up led type 180 watts the 40 watts are going to be some of the different devices inside of the fixture this includes the fans to keep things cool this includes the control protocols to make sure that we can communicate via our processor um, so this is something when you're designing a system making sure that you're looking at the full power consumption, not just the LED power consumption, and basing your loads off of that. One other quick little note uh, you'll see here is that there is uh, there's a fan controller. So typically, these devices have fans internally built in to keep the device cold uh, or cool. Uh, again, heat dissipation. But there is oftentimes ways to adjust the fans so we can have quieter performance if we need to. Um, typically at that point, it's going to come at the cost of how intense the light can be. Um, but again, different needs are going to require different types of uh, situations here. All right, and then again, IP classification. So this is how can this be used? Where can this be used? Uh, different types of uh, features that we're going to want to keep in mind. All right, so here we'll take a quick look uh, at some of this specialty stage application that we're talking about and some of these lights that we're talking about, right? So we have our different types of PARs and washes going on on the stage. This here is going to be a moving light with a gobo effect with different spotlighting that you see in the back here that's going to allow for control now for this project itself just a quick little aside this was using wireless dmx and so it allowed um, it didn't require the runs of the cat 5e or cat 6 cabling from the processor over in this case this was done as a retrofit that was trying to use um, save a little bit of budget uh, with wireless systems you do run the risk of uh, crowding in the bandwidth and when that happens, sometimes signal won't work as well as you want it to. You're going to run the risk of um, latency, or latency, so it's going to be a bit of a lag time from operating to the way that, uh, you know, from when the presets hit to when the action happens. So if there is ability to hardwire, that typically is going to be a more dependable system, but wireless systems are getting better and better 
And that's something that we'll talk about in our January webinar, the Lighting Controls 101 uh, webinar. All right, so different spotlighting positions, as mentioned before. I mentioned with the side lighting, we can have our vertical, um, uh, our vertical positions there, and we can put them in different areas to allow the side lighting. We can allow, and then having different angles and distances from the stage with our spots are going to allow for different types of uh, effects and different ways we're able to light up our characters and set um, on stage. Specialty lighting here is going to allow us to integrate the whole house. All right, so this is a project that was done in New Jersey, and this was putting in the LED strips underneath um, uh, the audio uh, buffering uh, system there on the side. So what this is allows us to do is all of a sudden now the whole stage can be part of the show, and this can all be controlled via the con um, central controls, whether it's through the lighting console or through a um, more software-based system. IL lighting, uh, as mentioned before, it is code required to have IL lighting, um, especially in uh, movie theaters, which tend to run very dark. Uh, so the different ways of achieving it, it can be achieved via strips, in this case, each on the stair. It can be achieved via strips on the side. It can also be achieved via up lighting to go and show the uh, means of aggress different ways, but these can also provide some unique ways of interacting with performances, especially when we start to bring color into the fold. Now, LED house lighting and emergency egress. So house lighting is going to be important. What we're showing here is different ways of uh, dimming, right? So we have full on, and when you notice the full on, if you notice there's an even wash across all the seats, we wanna make sure that we're doing proper photometrics. So we're looking properly at the light uh, distribution between the light intensity and the beam angle to keep an even wash. And we also wanna make sure that we're able to achieve a very, very low level of dimming, 0.1% dimming, uh, so that we can go and have that very smooth to off and we can keep a very low light um, during or between performances. So we have the full creative control. So I mentioned before here, again, the straight beam angles, you notice in this before here that we have patchy lighting. And we mentioned here, this is a school. And we mentioned earlier on about using this as a multi-purpose space, as a social distancing classroom and learning center. So we wanna make sure that the house lighting can be 30, 40, 50 foot candles at full on so that a student can be taking notes, reading, um, and using their stage and their whole auditorium for whatever purpose it needs to be. When we're looking at the light uh, selection for the house, we need to remember that typically there is going to be sloped ceilings and sloped flooring to provide the, uh, you know, the spectators the ability to see over the heads of the person in front, as well as to go and open up for the whole stage in front, uh, you know, and everything that that entails. So with that, we're gonna have to go and change out the intensity of lighting and the beam angle accordingly. Proper, proper photometrics will be important. And then on the side here of emergency egress, uh, this is going to be required uh, by code to make sure that the house lighting can be on full brightness in the case of emergency. So that can be done uh, here via an inverter. And then what we have here is a inside of the relay panel that we looked at in the beginning, a uh, right through a panic circuit there. So in the case that a panic signal is sent, the lighting can go via an inverter or generator, turn on fully, and you can have nice bright means of egress. This can also be linked up with a PA system and or a security system or panic system uh, in a school. It is recommended. Uh, especially with um, with the climate that we have uh, nowadays. I mentioned before the house lighting, slope ceiling, we need to accommodate it, and all the different specifications we need to take a look from the color temperature, the lumens delivered, the beam angle. Um, so again, 
proper phot photometrics will be highly required uh, to get the proper house lighting. All right, so, but when we talk about house lighting, we can do some really interesting things here. So I'm gonna skip ahead on this video a little bit because we can still have fun with our architectural design, right? So we have a honeycomb shape in this, uh, this design here, as well as RGBW strips across the side. I can please excuse the highlighter there. Um, we have strips inside the cove lighting to really provide um, an interesting effect for this uh, space. So finding the creativity, stamping these stages and these auditoriums, not just the stage itself, but the whole auditorium with your unique signature. It's part of the fun of designing the lighting system um, for a school or for any stage for that matter. Again, so in this case, we have RGBW strips, we have our honeycomb uh, up top, we have full on lighting control um, throughout. And so a, uh, a fun implementation right there. All right, so we're running towards the end of time. So I'm gonna kind of fly through the rest. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll stick around and answer some of them. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to connect either with myself or our chief uh, stage designer uh, afterwards to dive into the weeds. But with rigging, different types of rigging from dead hung to motorized, um, counterweight systems are what you'll typically see in a school. So this uses weights to uh, ensure that what's hung stays, but allows a pipe to be dropped. We want a pipe to be able to be dropped because that way you can put on different fixtures and adjust the fixtures without having to use a lift. So dead hung systems, like we see here, uh, maybe for a side joist there, uh, maybe for some positions, front of house and areas that can easily be accessed or areas where the lighting is very standard um, are fine, but uh, throughout uh, it is important to have access to the systems. And you also have the ability here to have motorized rigging uh, nowadays, which is going to be DMX controlled, um, does allow interaction to occur during performances and of course makes it incredibly simple to uh, lower and raise um, between performances to adjust any lighting and any devices on site on the rig itself. Okay. The other thing I should mention here is I don't have a slide for it, or I do uh, annual safety inspections for the rigging. So um, if you are working with a client or you have worked with a client in the past on their stage system, please make sure that they're getting it annually inspected uh, by an ETCP certified rigger. Uh, this is the major damage and life hazard uh, in a stage and in an auditorium. Uh, so uh, again, please take it seriously and make sure that there is regular inspection happening. So different systems that can be integrated, sound system, uh, we're not gonna go into the sound, this is lighting, but I do wanna mention sound because audio control is typically gonna be used beside the lighting control in what's called a roll top desk that can be locked down. This means that those pesky students who you don't want touching the system can't get to it. Um, and then acoustic tiling can be used um, inside of a auditorium to A, make sure that the sound is crisp and doesn't echo, but B, it allows more decorative um, engagement inside of a theater. And C, as shown uh, in that video before, they can be outfitted with LED strips to have really unique and interactive experiences for the entire performance. Uh, visual capabilities. Um, so again, to make sure that if broadcasting is happening, that the lighting is operating in a way that the broadcasting is going to be crisp, clear, and without undulations. And the ability to dim and affect lighting for the different types of visual capabilities, whether it's projection, front or rear, or a video wall. You wanna make sure that you're not causing glare or you're washing out light or anything like that. With all this integrated controls, it's going to be highly important, especially for a school that wants to rent out a theater or a school that has a typical overturn of staff. So integrated, especially uh, touch panel based controls allows for presets, allows for intuitive control and allows multiple different people to utilize the system uh, successfully and simply 
because we want the stage to be used. I've seen it way too often when there's been a full um, overhaul of a stage system, beautiful PAC level, and within two, three years, there's cobwebs in the corners uh, because no one's using the system because it's too complicated for them. On that side, um, we'll go back to curtains in just a moment. That was my bad joke. We wanna make sure that there's training for students and staff um, so that they can use the system. Knowledge is power. Uh, that's something that uh, to go and interface with them or to create right at the outset an annual training and retraining plan as well as system maintenance is going to be important. And there are student training opportunities as well. The US ITT is a beautiful uh, place to turn to for high school level and college level training. Uh, so just on the side of curtains, which do need to be said, uh, different types of flame retardedness. Uh, so typically new curtains are either going to be IFR or DFR. So it's going to be inherently or durably flame retardant. That means that it will block um, fires from happening. But older curtain systems might need to be uh, applied with the treatment to make them uh, flame proof. And annual uh, or regular uh, inspection of it is important. Typically, there's little um, pull-offs that could be sent in uh, for remote uh, checking. So again, another place where there's a hazard here is the uh, curtains. Want to go and make sure that that's addressed here. All right, and so on this side, I'll go and uh, end off the webinar. We're a little bit over time here. So again, we have future AA accredited classes coming up. Uh, I hope they'll join me for them. So IQ IQ is happening next month. Lighting Controls 101 will dive more into the wired and wireless conversation. It's going to happen in January and in February, we'll dive into FAR UV and the potential and future that hopefully that holds for existing and new constructions. So I appreciate your time here. I'll stick around for any questions that might arise. Again, if you want to schedule a lunch and learn for your firm, or you want to dive in further into questions about the webinar or about opportunities to work and partner together, uh, please reach out. That's my email right there, danapurelighting.com. Um, our website is pure-lighting.com. And that's my direct line. So feel free to call me uh, at any time. Remember, I'm on the West Coast, so if you call early in the morning and I don't answer, don't take offense because I do need my beauty sleep, but otherwise I'm happy to, uh, to talk at any time. So again, thanks a lot for your time today.